Our next speaker is also uh, a recorded talk. Uh, this is to be given by Ashraf Ibrahim, who is a professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, he's also senior investor and vice chair of the board of directors at the uh, Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute at Harbor UCLA. Um, he's gonna talk to us today about uh, GPR78 receptor and its possible links to COVID associated mucormycosis. Thank you, Ashra. Uh, hi, this is Ashraf Ibrahim. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today about potential uh, relationship between uh, uh, cell surface receptor, glucose-regulated protein, molecular weight 78, and mucormycosis in COVID-19 patients. So before I start, just a quick reminder about mucormycosis. It's a fungal infection. Uh, it's lethal in nature. Um, it can uh, be um, acquired by inhalation or ingestion. Inhalation by far is the most common route of infection that results mainly in two forms of disease, either rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis, mainly seen in diabetics and ketoacidosis, or pulmonary infection, mainly seen in hematologic malignancies patients. Uh, cutaneous infection can also happen through direct inoculation into open wounds, such as seen either in uh, uh, military um, personnel uh, subjected to uh, uh, improvised uh, uh, explosives or uh, motorcycle accidents. Uh, the problem with mucormycosis, as we all know, the mortality is very high. Uh, overall mortality is approximately 50%, and it can be up to 90 to 100% in certain categories of patients. Um, lately, mucormycosis uh, in COVID-19 patients was uh, um, highlighted in uh, media outlets because of the outbreak that we've seen in many parts of the world, uh, in particular in India, within a two month period between May to July of 2021, the official counts of mucormycosis uh, uh, or COVID-19 associated mucormycosis scam were reported to be more than uh, 47,000 47, cases. They were mainly seen in diabetics, uh, uh, patients who are being treated with high doses of corticosteroids to treat basically the cyto cytokine storm that results from COVID-19 uh, uh, infections. And it's mainly of the rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis. Uh, GRP78 is a heat shock protein, stress related, usually overexpressed in um, certain situations, such as infections, as well as in cancer cells. Uh, GRP78 is mainly a cytoplasmic protein, but under stress related conditions, and when it is overexpressed, it can be relocalized to the cell surface of uh, cells. Um, there are actually several reports showing that GRP78 can act as a receptor to several viruses, including dengue, Zika viruses, and recently SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, in their entry basically into the host cells. And as a result, there is a possibility that GRP78 acts as a receptor for COVID-19, and I'll show you some data to, uh, uh, later on in the presentation. So when we started basically looking at GRP78 um, uh, and the possibility of it being a receptor to mucormycosis, we basically uh, conducted uh, an in vitro assay to see if rhizopus spores being the most common cause of infection can actually invade either nasal epithelial cells or lung epithelial cells because we've reasoned that this is basically the first uh, uh, line of interaction when the organism is being inhaled. And you can see here within short period of time with interacting with CCL30 cells, uh, which are nasal epithelial cells, rice spores can actually uh, invade uh, uh, really quickly. And within six hours, you have 100% invasion. And this invasion is not just basically the cells lying on the monolayers, but actually, as you can see here in the three-dimensional confocal microscopy, it's an actual penetration of the nasal cells. And that entry results also in death of the 
of host cells, the nasal cells, in a time-dependent manner. Within 48 hours, you get approximately 80 to 90 percent of the cells are being killed by using the chrome release assay. So, with that being said, we were interested in trying to figure out what is the receptors involved in that entry into nasal cells. And what we did is we used basically an old technique developed by Eisberg and Leong, which is basically an affinity maturation or affinity purification, whereby you take the host cells, biotinylate them, and then extract their cell membranes, incubate the cell membranes, which are now biotinylated with spores of, of rhizopus. And then after a certain period of time, you extensively wash the unbound cell, the unbound proteins, and then you can elute the band proteins by uh, six molar urea, run them on a gel by SDS page, and by using antibiotic antibodies, you can actually detect certain bands that bound to the spores. And you can take those, basically cut them off the gel, sequence them, and you will have an idea on what the uh, protein of the cell membrane protein that bound to your um, organism. And what we found is when we incubated rice plus Delamar, the most common protein that came out is basically at a kilo, uh, molecular weight kilodalton, 78 kilodalton. And that was basically when we uh, did the sequence was GRP78 uh, protein. So what we did is we based, you can see here the total membranes without being incubated, RISPUS are actually well biotinylated, which is really a good control. And there is this really distinct band here in RISPUS. So if you take the same membrane and you strip it and then you blot it again with anti-GRP78, which is commercially available, you'll see that you can detect really the same band here again, indicating that this is basically what's bounding to the spores of rice -pastelamon. And it seems that this is also not only specific to rice but it's really a universal receptor to all mycorrhalis. Because you can see here you pull down the same band with a GRP78 uh, binding to different mucorallis, uh, as you can see here. We did the same thing with lung ichthyia cells. And what we found is the major protein was not GRP78, but rather integrin beta 1 alpha 3. And then if you use uh, the same technique by blotting the same membrane with uh, blotted with antibiotin with commercially available anti-integrin beta-1 antibodies, you basically detect the same band, indicating that this is probably the receptor for lung ichthyia cells during invasion with mucorallis. And again, this is really a universal band showing uh, with different uh, uh, clinical isolates of mucorallis. So to prove that the GRP78 is a receptor for nasal ichthyia cells, we uh, used uh, both antibodies that we uh, have commercially against GRP78 and anti-integrin antibodies. And we wanted to see whether these antibodies can block adhesion and invasion uh, to a nasal ichthyia cells. And you can see here that our anti-GRP78 was able to block invasion by approximately 50% to nasal ichthyia cells, whereas anti-integrin beta-1 antibody didn't. Uh, there was no effect on adhesion. We believe that receptors mediating adhesion and invasion are totally different. These are two different processes. Usually initiates with adhesion, the organism rolls on, binds to another receptor, and that triggers invasion. And what we found is if you block invasion, you actually block the ability of the organism to damage uh, the uh, nasal epithelial cells as well. But only with anti-GRP78, and nothing really happens with anti-integrin beta-1 antibodies. Again, um, uh, corroborating what we found with the affinity purification process, that uh, GRP78 is the receptor for nasal epithelial cells. We did the same thing with lung epithelial cell, and it's totally the opposite. You'll see that the anti-integrin beta-1 almost completely blocks invasion, whereas anti-GRP78 doesn't. Again, indicating that the receptor for lung ichthyia cells is uh, uh, integrin beta-1 alpha-3. And again, you'll see basically if you block invasion, you really block the ability of the pathogen to cause damage. On the other side of the coin, we wanted to understand what's on the fungus binds to these receptors. So what we did, we used something called far western blotting, whereby you actually, if you know the receptor, you take your um, uh, 
of rispus, you protoplast them. And if you put them, regenerate, put them in an osmolytic stabilizer, such, such as sorbitol, and let them regenerate, they'll start sputing basically all cell wall material into the cyto into the supernatant. You take the supernatant, concentrate it, run it on a non uh, denaturing gel. And then you come with your um, newly identified receptor, in this case, GRP78 or integrin beta 1 alpha 3. And with the anti integrin or anti GRP78, you'll, you'll be able to pinpoint a certain a band on the non denaturing gel. You can take it, sequence it, and it will give you an idea about what fungal ligand binds to these receptors. What we found is with the nasal cells, uh, cut H3 bound to GRP78. We did the same thing with lung epithelia cells, and we found that it is cut H7. So both of them, obviously, they belong to the same uh, family of proteins, cut H. Uh, in collaboration with Vinnie Bruno at University of Maryland, we were able to sequence uh, 30 plus isolates of mycorrhizae. All of them are clinical isolates. And cat H is a unique member of cell surface proteins, GPI anchor proteins, extremely expressed in mycorrhizae, whether spores or germlings. And they are really unique to mycorrhizae. You can't find them anywhere else, any fungi, bacteria, or any form of life, or even mammalian cells. And you can see here that these isolates here, all of them, they contain cut H proteins, ranging anywhere between one to seven copies. And you can see that the last three are, these are basidibolus and conidibolus, which are really previously were classified as zygomyces, but they form a non-invasive uh, disease, totally uh, different from neochromycosis. And again, uh, emphasizing the fact that these proteins are professional invasions. They allow the organism to invade host cells. So what we did is cut H3 and cut H7. They have a certain motif. That motif is predicted to be antigenic, as well as also uh, residing in the binding facet of cut H pro proteins to the receptors. Um, um, so what we did is we raised antibodies against that peptide. And you can see that the identity here close to 70%. And we used these antibodies to see whether we can block invasion and damage to the host cells. And here, um, studying rice plus Delamar with nasal epithelia cells in the presence of anti-cut H antibodies, you can completely block invasion, more or less completely. But, and then you have more than 70 to 80% also uh, prevention of uh, rice plus mediated damage to nasal epithelia cells. Same thing can be said for lung epithelia cells as well. So these antibodies seems to be protective and we've shown in animal models that these antibodies are actually highly protective and we currently now we have a humanized antibody that we are uh, trying to develop for uh, clinical trials. Um, so um, what I would like to also emphasize here is trying to understand why diabetics in ketoacidosis usually have a nasal uh, uh, or rhinoorbital disease, whereas lung aware that neutropenic have basically um, a lung disease. So we reason that in, in diabetics, in ketoacidosis in particular, there are certain host factors that uh, organisms and cells are exposed to. These are hyperglycemia, obviously. Um, uh, there is also hyperglycemia and ketoacidosis um, cause what we call elevated available serum iron because they compromise the ability of transferrin to uh, bind iron very well. And as a result, you'll have basically free iron floating in uh, the blood or in the serum. And this is now well documented that this iron actually causes a lot of problems in diabetics uh, or, or uh, who have poorly uh, controlled uh, diabetes. So what we did is we took concentrations that are physiologically present in these patients of glucose, iron, or BHP, or uh, being uh, uh, a classic uh, ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate. And we uh, studied the expression of GRP78 on nasal cells. And you can see as you increase the concentration of glucose from the normal one milligram per uh, ml, to four and eight, you have higher uh, uh, expression of GRP78 on the cell surface of these cells. Same thing can be said at 15 and 50 uh, micromolar, micrograms per ml of iron, 
and BHB of millimolar 5 and 10 as well can be as high as six-fold increase of uh, uh, GRP78. And that really translates into the ability of RISPUS or ISO or RISPUS Telemar and others as well that I don't have the time to show you to actually have enhanced envision of these cells at these concentrations and, and um, a gradual increase as you can see here. And also that translates on a higher or an increased ability of the fungus to cause damage to these cells as well. What we did is we also studied these factors on lung epithelial cells. Remember the lung epithelial cells, they have actually uh, um, um, integrin beta-1 alpha-3, and we just really couldn't see any enhancement of expression of GRP78 or uh, integrin beta-1 uh, alpha-3 or actually subsequent invasion and, and, and damage. So we came up with a model that explains why diabetics and ketoacidosis are predisposed to rhino orbital disease rather than lung infection, whereby uh, a person who is uh, in diabetics in, a high, in poorly controlled diabetes, hyperglycemia, or in ketoacidosis inhales spores as anybody else. And due to the fact that you have uh, environmental factors or host factors such as hyperglycemia, elevated iron, and uh, ketoacidosis, you have an enhanced expression of GLP78 that as a result basically traps the spores into the sinus and that causes infection. So in other words, the, the spores that are inhaled never really gets all the way into the alveoli to cause pulmonary infection. Whereas it's totally the opposite in pulmonary infection, you really uh, have no overexpression of GRP78 in the nasal cavity. As a result, inhaled spores get into the lungs and they bind to integrin beta 1 and 3. And we've, we know that integrin beta 1 and 3 activates uh, the EGFR receptor or core receptor, and that basically by phosphorylation, and that triggers the invasion process as well. So now, where, where does GRP78 as a receptor for COVID-19 comes, comes um, in? So there was a publication shortly after the first wave that we've had in the US came out, I think in March of 2020, by using molecular docking analysis, they showed that cell surface GRP78 depicted here in green uh, is predicted to bind spike protein of COVID-19. And, and uh, that was literally all done by molecular modeling. Um, and then shortly after, uh, in early 2021, uh, this paper came from the lab of Amy Lee, who works really on GRP78 and its role in cancer cells. And she has an antibody, human has antibody, that's actually developed to specifically block GRP78 in, in uh, hopefully in uh, uh, treating cancer, uh, several cancers, whereby GRP78 is implicated in, in uh, uh, promoting cancer cells or, or growth. And well, what they did is they're actually clever. They used epithelial cells uh, that, that is overexpressing ACE2, human ACE2, which is, as you know, is the receptor or accepted receptor for uh, spike protein. And they are uh, 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 expressed, recombinantly expressed on those cells, either a hemagglutinin spike protein or a flag of a flag protein GRP78. And you can see here in the whole cell lysate that these are really well expressed in spike protein GRP78. And by using immunoprecipitation, either by using an anti uh, hemagglutinin antibody, you actually uh, uh, detect the spike as you would expect because it is a hemagglutinin spike. But also in addition to this, even though that this is GRP78 is not hemagglutinin um, tag, but you can pull it down. And, and the same thing can be said with the anti-flag as well. This indicates that there is some sort of an interaction between GRP78 and spike and, and, and the ACE2. And by using also antibodies uh, uh, incubated uh, with lung epithelial cells uh, prior to introducing a vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, they were able to show that these antibodies, which are specific to GRP78, the humanized antibody, you can actually hear uh, block GRP78, as you would expect, from binding to ACE2. And as a result, it prevents 
the um, uh, the um, v VSV virus through the particles of binding to ACE2, and as a result, it prevents endocytosis. And presumably, and they haven't shown that, that this antibody would actually protect against uh, 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 COVID-19 infections. And this is, this is yet to be seen. So, um, so how does this translate into mucormycosis or CAM, or COVID-19 associated mucormycosis? There was another study that came also earlier this year showing that uh, patients who uh, suffer from COVID-19 pneumonia, depicted here in black, and there were 72 of them, they express what we call serum GRP78. In other words, probably um, uh, cell surface uh, GRP78, you know, relocalized to the cell surface. When you compare it to Patients who had signs of pneumonia, but they were negative by, uh, for uh, PCR tests for COVID-19, and also negative with pneumonia um, as depicted by x-rays, and also compared to normal people as well. So this increase in GRP78 um, is now a fact among uh, patients who suffer from COVID-19, which is expected. This is, as we said, it's, it's a heat shock protein overexpressed in stressful conditions. And there is really nothing more stressful than an infection, um, especially like life-threatening infection. So, so uh, it's a possibility that the GRP78 overexpressed might actually act as a receptor for patients who suffer from uh, mucormycosis or, or, or CAM. Uh, but is it is it really the only reason or not? And then I'll get to that. So just to summarize, RISPUS invades nasal epithelial cells by cot h 3 grp 78 And this interaction is really modulated by host factors present in diabetic ketoacidosis, such as hyperglycemia, elevated available serum iron, as well as ketone bodies, resulting in basically uh, trapping the spores as they are being inhaled into the nasal cavity, causing uh, rhino orbital uh, cerebral mucormycosis. Rispus invades alveolar epithelial cells by cut H7 interacting with integrin beta 1, which triggers activation of the EGFR uh, receptors in tissues and causing basically infusion and pulmonary mucormycosis. And this process is not regulated by DKA host factors. As in many viral infections, GRP78 is overexpressed in patients with COVID-19 and may act as an auxiliary receptor to the virus, mainly by binding to ACE2 and uh, uh, spike protein. We actually have done in the lab direct interaction between ACE2 and GRP78 by themselves, uh, or, or sorry, between um, GRP78 and spike protein by itself, and we couldn't really see much of interaction. It seems that the presence of ACE2 is necessary to show that there is some interaction between ACE2, uh, GRP78, and, and spike protein. So again, the question is, is COVID-19 infection sufficient to cause mucormycosis infection through overexpression of GRP78? And to me, it is unlikely. And the reason for this, because this is not the only cause why those patients are suffering from mucormycosis. We know from the clinical data that patients who have COVID-19 and develop mucormycosis are usually treated with very high doses of corticosteroids to stem the tide of the hyperinflammatory immune response triggered by COVID-19. So, uh, and, and this basically doesn't really happen in those who are not treated with corticosteroids. So to me, I think um, in diabetics ketoacidosis, the presence of hyperglycemia or prolonged hyperglycemia, even in the absence of ketoacidosis is sufficient to cause infection or a risk factor to the extent that it overexpresses GRP78 to very high levels and causing infection, even if, G if, if ketoacidosis is not present. If ketoacidosis is present, then you have even more expression of GRP78. And as a result, those patients become uniquely predisposed to, to mucormycosis. The other thing which also have to take in mind, there is also environmental factors. The burden of disease in India in particular has always been high. We knew that even prior to COVID-19. And uh, there are studies uh, by uh, Chakrabarti and Parkash 
showing that the burden of disease is at least 70 fold higher than any other part of the world. India was, was predicted to have, through population based studies, predicted to have approximately 200,000 cases of mucormycosis per year. And now we believe it because. The 47,000 documented, or actually 48,000 documented cases within two months, one third of those are non COVID related, meaning that we have approximately 17 to 18,000 cases of mucormycosis in India that were reported within two to, two to three months among non COVID related uh, patients as well. So, lastly, I would like to finish by thanking people who have uh, been involved in this research line of research, including uh, the two most important in this particular receptor work is Tekle Gerges Gebre Mariam, as well as Abdallah Al Karik. Abdallah is a PhD student who is working on the nasal and the lung PSLs, trying to understand what are the predisposing factors. Emily has been generous with us in providing her um, uh, raw materials and important uh, 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 things that we use in our research for proving that GRP78 is actually a receptor for mucoralis, both in nasal PSLs and also in, in the PSLs during dissemination, metagenous dissemination. And finally, of course, the support from the Boris Volkan Fund and the National Institutes of Health. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much.